Good morning from New York. I'm Chris Hayes. A 32-year-old Iraqi mother of five died yesterday after being found beaten in her home Wednesday in El Cajon, California. People, police say they are not ruling out any motive, but a note found next to Shaima Alawadi reportedly said, go back to your country, you terrorist. Alawadi wore a headscarf as part of her Muslim faith. She had helped train U.S. soldiers for deployment to the Middle East and lived in the U.S. since the mid-90s. Right now, joining me today, we have Steven Pinker, a cognitive science and scientist and professor of psychology at Harvard University, author most recently of just a phenomenal book called The Better Angels of Our Nature, Why Violence Has Declined, which he's just told me before we went on air, he wrote in about seven days. <laughs> Jamila Bay, host of, host of Sparring with Jamila, the Sex, Politics, and Religion Hour on the Voice of Russian Radio Network and a contributor to the Washington Post blog, She of the People. Susan Jacoby, author of Free Thinkers, A History of American Secularism, as well as Now Out in Paperback, Never Say Die, The Myth and Marketing of the New Old Age. And Jamie Kilstein, comedian and co-host of a fantastic podcast called Citizen Radio. All Great right. to have you all here. Thanks. All right, an estimated crowd of between 18 and 10,000 atheists, although Jamila says is much more, agnostics and non-believers gathered on the National Mall in Washington yesterday for the Reason Rally. The point of the rally, according to its organizers, was to create connections among people who live a life by not believing in God. Here's Adam Savage, co-host of the Discovery Channel show, Mythbusters speaking at yesterday's rally. I have concluded through careful empirical analysis and much thought that somebody is looking out for me, keeping track of what I think about things, forgiving me when I do less than I ought, giving me strength to shoot for more than I think I'm capable of. I believe they know everything that I do and think and they still love me and I've concluded after careful consideration that this person keeping score is me. Big applause line. It's also more than that. Uh, the rally was meant as a salvo, a coming out party, trying to create an actual political coalition. On Friday, nearly 300 atheists met with staffers in the House and Senate to lobby and show their numbers. And speaking of numbers, we thought this data was very interesting. According to a survey in 2008 by the American Religious Identification Survey, the country's atheist and agnostic population has gone from 8% in 1990 to 14% in 2001 to 15% in 2008. So it seems like the trend is in a certain direction. Um, Jamie Kilstein, you were there. You did, yeah. did, did a few sets at the rally yesterday. I did. So here, here's my question, and, and, and for everyone at the panel. You know, if someone said to me, are you an atheist? I'd say, yeah, basically, more or less. I don't spend a ton of time thinking about it in either direction. But if someone said, I want you to list all the ways you identify yourself, I would get through pages and pages before I got to that as an identity, right? right? I think of all so many other things as so much more core to who I am, what forms my worldview, what my political beliefs are. What, why is it important to you as a sort of identity badge and how plausible is it that that can be extended outwards? Well, I mean, I, I, I think in a perfect world, what you said is correct, you know, right? Because what is atheism? It's like a non-belief. So you don't list all of the things you don't believe in. Right, uh, when you're identifying when yourself. When you are identifying right. yourself, like, well, let me, here's what I'm not. Right. Um, but at the same time, the, the problem, and you know, progressives kind of go through this too, is, you know, a lot of times we aren't active. A lot of times, you know, progressives or atheists do tend to be apathetic because I think there's part of us that's like, but we're right, so why should I have to go outside like Breaking Bad's on? Right, like, right. why, <laughs> if I have all the facts on my side, <laughs> right, right. why do I need to actually go out there? But the problem is what the right and what the religious right especially are really good at what they lack in sort of empathy and, and facts and just goodwill in general, they make up for in pamphlet making skills. And they're very, very organized and they do lobby really hard. And you know, they're lobbying for things that aren't just about beliefs. They're lobbying to take away legitimate, tangible rights from gay people, from sure. women, uh, et cetera. So that kind of forces us to organize, I think. Right, but, the, but can, can you back into it? Can you back, that, I mean, that's the thing, right? Can, can opposition create an identity? Well, there... well first of all, there, there's one problem in, in linking atheism and politics, which is I understand that people like Rick Santorum and a lot of people in America have this idea that atheists are all political liberals. That's where the term secular socialism comes from. Right. But in fact, it's not true. Sure. There, are really, there are really two strands of atheism or a secular approach to public affairs, whichever you're talking about. One of them descends from Thomas Paine, who was a secular humorist, humanist, and the other descends from the social Darwinists of the 19th century 
century, right through Ayn Rand in the 20th century, who was an extreme civil libertarian, which, by the way, the religious right, which worships Ayn Rand views on the free market, right. doesn't mention that she was an atheist. So atheists do not agree on everything politically anymore that I'm sure you can find some vegetarians who are, who are worshipers of the free market, too. Sure. They may agree on their vegetarianism, but not on that. So one of the problems with secular people having a movement of political influence is that they don't all have the same political values. Right, and, 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 it's, and it's, it seems, strikes me that it's more than that. It's not just that they don't have the same political values. It's the primacy of where that falls in how they think of themselves as political actors, right? Before you even get to the problem of conflict, there's the problem of how you identify. Well, it falls more, you know, what, what you said, which is atheists would be way down on your list if you were to take one of those tests in which you identify yourself. That would have been true of me years ago. A writer would be first, probably, or right. a woman. However, as, as I've focused more in my writing on these topics, I have come to realize how central my atheism is to the way I think about a lot of things. For example, uh, health care and and the right to die and whether whether we are all obligated to use all the resources of modern modern medicine to extend our lives i know that the fact that i'm an atheist affects my views on these things because i believe that my life is my own and to a great extent also the people i love and who love me but i don't believe that i owe it to god for example right. if i have parkinson's disease to live right. with it for for four or five years as the pope did uh, J Jamila, how much do you see um, the, the, the sort of plausibility of creating an actual political coalition uh, around this identity? Well, the thing that I deeply believe is simply admitting that you are atheist is a political act. Mm -hmm. The reason why is that when you look at the, f the fact that religi religiosity and Christianity in particular is shorthand for trustworthiness mm -hmm. and faithfulness, that is the language that our politicians have been using to get votes. So when you say, I'm an atheist, uh, you've, you've completely taken yourself out of the realm of ever seeking public office, yeah. with, with one exception that's out. You know, uh, um, Congressman Pete Stark from, from the East Bay in California, who we have the tape of later, but I, I want to show this Gallup polling because I think this is really interesting. It's, 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 it's about 10 years old, but, I, but it's sort of, um, I, I think, captures what is broadly the, the sort of reality of this. This is asking, would you vote for a qualified presidential candidate who was a blank? Uh, um, and uh, or, or would you refuse to vote, right? Those are the negative numbers. What percentage of people would just sort of look at someone who was a qualified blank and say no? Catholic, black, Jewish, female, Mormon, gay, Muslim, and atheist are the winners, with atheist edging out gay and Muslim, which is really kind of shocking, right? Because if you were to think about the a radical reconception of the presidency, an image of a gay president, for instance, mm -hmm. seems like it would be such a, more, uh, a larger departure Right. from the status quo than just someone who happened not to believe in God, right? People hate science. A gay science. Muslim atheist, forget it. Well, I think, I, think, I think it's fair to say no gay Muslim atheist will be elected uh, a president of the United States in, in, in the near future. But, but that, that statistic, I think, speaks to your point, right? Absolutely. That there's a sort of way in which faithfulness, faithfulness in a specific doctrinal tradition is understood in the political realm to mean faithfulness as the general kind of moral faithfulness. Indeed, and uh, th that language is allowed to persist uh, nobody questions, well, what exactly do you mean when you say that God told you to run for this office? What exactly do you feel your obligation is when your, your doctrine says, you know, whatever you do unto the least of me, or unto the least of my people that you do unto me, and right. you're, you're not acting that way. Right. Um, we, we allow this shorthand to happen that says, oh, church, you know, devout, this, that, other, and uh, we, we let these people will just go ahead and, and dictate what should be in accordance with their personal beliefs. So when you come out and say, I have no belief in any of that because you're skeptical and you say you have to make a case for everything you're alleging to me, people go, oh, you think too much, you're scary, and, well, and how dare you? But I want, I want to go back to this, this question about, you know, not, you know th this has become part of the, the ritual almost of running for president, which is you talk about the moment that you're called, basically. It's mm -hmm. become, there's this... There's now this built into the narrative, uh, particularly in the Republican president, presidential primary, a kind of vocational moment, right, where, where oh. you, you say it in some way. And I think that, I, I think when we think about how to be critical of that, it gets into this question of 
how much do we really want to get into people's beliefs in general uh, to preserve the sort of nature of secular democracy? Let's talk about that right after we take this break. All right, I, I want to talk about some Pew polling that came out that I thought was interesting in terms of the trend lines because obviously I think it's clear we should just make sort of manifest the subtext here, which is that to the degree there's some kind of political mobilization around the identity of, of, of non-believers, of atheism, it is largely, I would say, in response to the mobilization of the religious you know, religion and politics and the religious right. And so I think that this polling from, from Pew, which sort of looks at attitudes on, on, uh, on how people feel about how much religion there is in public, public speech, for the first time, uh, there's now more people saying there's too much religion in political speech mm -hmm. than saying too little, which I thought was really interesting. And I think we've seen a trend line where, and, 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 and when you dig into the crosstabs of this polling, which is very interesting, there's all these interesting partisan divides, right? Because there's also um, people who say they they, they sort of um, they think uh, Democrats are more hostile to religion, but they also think that Republicans talk about religion too much, right? So there's some sort of alienation going on uh, as well. And it, it brings me this, when you look at those trend lines, it sort of brings me the question of the degree to which there should be a kind of proactive evangelical thrust to an atheist movement, if there is such a thing, whether you should be out sort of trying to convince people and disabuse them of the beliefs that you think they should not hold, Steven Pinker. I think atheists sometimes have to rise to the challenge that when politicians inject religion where it doesn't belong, in science education, in political legislation, uh, then those arguments have to be countered. But the best arguments uh, for atheism aren't going to mention atheism per se, but rather all of the accomplishments of Western civilization that owe nothing to religion. The fantastic scientific understanding we have of the universe, the fantastic progress we've made thanks to the doctrine of human rights. Uh, the reason that I don't trumpet atheism is that it's just kind of a, a, a nuisance to have to deny a bunch of irrelevant considerations when there's so much positive that we can point to. I, I, I completely, I completely agree with him. Here's one of the things I always say: uh, is that freedom of religion, freedom of conscience, is a secular idea. Before, with the Enlightenment, and America was the first national government in the world to separate church and state. Freedom of conscience as a religious idea only means freedom of conscience for me, right. as in the case right. with the right. Puritans who settled right. in Massachusetts, <coughs> set up a theocracy, and the difference between the new world and the old was simply that instead of who was running the show instead of killing Roger <laughs> Williams and Ann Hutchinson there was land right. if you if you disagreed with the prevailing theocracy there was a place to move which there wasn't in Europe and this is always it amazes people you don't need to say uh, yeah you don't have to believe in God you just talk about freedom of religion the freedom of religion which all religions enjoy in this country it's not a religious idea it's a it's secular, secular idea well, I think what that poll shows too is that uh, especially the religious right in this country has overstepped their bounds, right? I know I, I was so proud yesterday to speak uh, in front of 20,000 people about atheism, but if, you know, the religious right wasn't going after people's fundamental rights, if, you know, religious people were like, yeah, let's help the poor and down with bankers and I like Christmas, I wouldn't right. be like, we need to gather on right. the mall yeah. right, 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 and right. shut this thing down. And <laughs> but, that's, but that gets to my point, right, which is that fundamentally your first identity is as a, I know you, I mean, your first yeah. identity is, is, is your politics well, as a progressive. And so right? that's what I do, right? So I, I, I really don't go around talking about atheism because you're right, Stephen. It's just like, it, it's just so frustrating just being like, but I don't believe in it. But what I do do is I do try to argue on uh, on political issues, right? So if you're having a conversation with a religious person and maybe, you know, I, I would start with something like gay rights or something with women's rights that they could maybe relate to as opposed to being like everything you have been taught since a child is incorrect because right. I think you're yeah, dumb. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Look, look also, this whole d debate about about Catholic hospitals, uh, whether they're required to cover contraception or not, there is an important point that the mainstream media, because we've become accustomed to thinking in terms of a debate framed right, right, by right. religion, yeah. uh, they talk about it either as 
though it's a matter of religious liberty or contraception. No, it's not mm -hmm. fundamentally a matter of either. It's a, it's a matter of religious institutions wanting to spend everybody's tax money according to their religious doctrines, which is a whole Absolutely. different right. matter than either of them. And the very first law separating church and state in this country, the Virginia Act for Establishing Religious Freedom, served as the template for the Constitution, came because Madison, James Madison, convinced people to reject a proposal to have property taxes for the support of Christian teaching uh, in schools. It's the same issue as the hospital issue. Well, I'm so I, I, glad I, you brought that up, Susan. Um, you know, one of, one of the things that um, I want to get back to in your original, well, one of your questions is, uh, you know, how, how much of a, of a drumbeat should we be banging toward atheism and being evangelical? Um, as an African American, I, and as a woman, just in case. Right. Um, <laughs> we, ha we have that in the Chiron, you know, I think, on the, you're labeled on the It's not as good as a gay Muslim president. Right. Well, yeah. I'm, I'm getting there, you know, I'm getting there. Uh, but when when I am seen in this country, uh, and I and, and my African American-ness is, is addressed, there is the understanding that, well, I am a religious person for someone looking at me. African American women are the single most religious demographic in this country. Mm -hmm. We also are the least likely to have any real property. Uh, the net worth of an average African American woman uh, as of 2010 was $5. $5. $5. We out tithe every other group. Hmm. What does that mean? When, when, when we make decisions about our health care as African American women, and, and I'm sure there are exceptions, please don't Twitter bomb me. About, like, I don't. I know you don't. I'm talking in general. Um, but we are more likely to pray and trust God right. rather than going and, you know, getting on an exercise plan, losing weight, and not being diabetic anymore. We are more likely <laughs> to say, well, you know, contraception, my, I will fall in line with what my particular church says about contraception, uh, even though we know that African American women are the demographic that are most likely to become newly infected with HIV and AIDS. If you go to a church where the pastor says, well, condom use is what you should do, right. that's what you're going to do. If right. you don't, you won't. Yeah. And there are very real consequences for people who look as I do, uh, who allow religion to make the decisions for them. So when I say, you've got to think differently, I'm imputing their religious teachings. Right. And so I, I get called an evangelical atheist, I guess I am, um, but that's simply because the social issues and the factual issues. Because you think the stakes at, at the heart of it are high. The stakes at the heart of it are high and people are uh, people are ascribing you know their absolute decisions to what some man in a robe says. Yeah I mean I've, I've seen religion hurt people too on a on a smaller scale from as simple as you know uh, just kind of not doing as much maybe for charity because they think God's gonna take care of it or yeah although know. we should say I mean the, the data on this is very clear Re religious people do give more money to charity but a lot and of actually that, conservatives give conservatives versus liberals give a lot more money to charity etc but a lot of that charity is going to, to churches church yeah no no no, 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 no I'm sure that's obviously that's the biggest amount well, right. well, well, what I was gonna say I, I wanted to oh, sure. that but in fact religious people give more money than secular people do to secular charities. Well, that's I true. Have found that's Jesus. true. <laughs> uh, no, no, Jamie with an honor I, conversion. I'm converted. This no, is but right. one, of the thing, one of the things that atheists are and, and that I, I believe truly is a value of atheism is honesty. I'm not going to sit here and pretend that the secular, oh by the way, secular conservatives are much more stingy than secular liberals. <laughs> the Ayn Rand people give the least to everybody. I, 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 do, I do want to say this before, before I go is that you know, it, it, there is a part of me, especially with this panel, that I just want to spend the whole time being like, you know, like, aren't atheists smart? But right. they're all, that's what I want to avoid. So. Yeah, well, but, but but there is part of me where, and especially politically, a lot of times I do get upset uh, with atheists, and I'll actually do the opposite, where I'll use my atheism to convince atheists when it comes to politics. So, for example, all of the <laughs> atheists that advocated the Iraq War or advocate uh, violence in the Middle East, I would actually argue that as much good as they may have done here, turning agnostics into atheists, they've actually created more religious extremes by going over and, you know, killing You're talking about uh, Christopher Muslim Hitchens children. and Sam Harris. Yeah, who both, yeah, totally. It's like when you go over there, look, the the child, as much as you want to blame everything on Islam, the child over in the Gaza Strip doesn't know what the word martyr means. Right, right. But all he knows is he wants food and he wants someone to tell him it's okay because he's really scared. And if we go over there, look, 
honestly, we are so we are in so much trouble as a country right now, all of us, and we're all kind of being screwed over by the same people, that if a Muslim person wants to tell me that he wants to fight with me to end the wars, I'm going to fight with him, right? right? right. If a uh, Christian wants to say he right. wants to march for gay marriage, I'm going to march with that right. guy because right. at this point we have to join forces, I think. Jamie Kilstein, a comedian and co-host of the podcast Citizen Radio, performed at the Reason Rally yesterday. Thanks so much for coming. Thank really you, Chris. Appreciate Thank it. you so much. I want to bring in Robert Wright, author of The Evolution of God, when we return. Nice to meet you. Congressman Paul Ryan introduced his latest budget proposal this week. It would cut spending from Medicare, President Obama's health care law, and other programs like food stamps, welfare, and federal employee pensions. More than $5 trillion over the next decade it would give that money to the rich and some $4 trillion in tax cuts, according to Citizens for Tax Justice. Some religious leaders called it, quote, unconscionable and an immoral disaster. Ryan disagrees. He's a practicing Catholic, yet he requires his staff to read Ayn Rand's novel Atlas Shrugged and calls <laughs> Rand the reason I got involved in public Public service, actual quote. Ayn Rand, of course, was famously a non-believer. Some of the religious left have used Rand to drive a wedge between economic conservatives and religious conservatives, such as when she was featured in an ad by the American Values Network. You scorn churches and the concept of God. Are these accurate criticisms? Yes. I am the creator of a new code of morality, a morality not based on faith. Rush Limbaugh called her brilliant, and Fox and Friends declared her movie a victory for capitalism. And as for the author of the Republican budget, Paul Ryan. Ayn Rand, more than anyone else, did a fantastic job of explaining the morality of capitalism, the morality of individualism. And this, to me, is what is matters most. And here's James Salt of the group Catholics United confronting Ryan about modeling his budget last summer on the teachings of Ayn Rand. I'm a Christian or practicing Catholic like you. Oh, great. I have a question. Um, why did you choose to model your budget off the extreme ideology of Ayn Rand rather than uh, basic economic justice and values of the Bible? How about the idea of putting your Medicare in the debt Excuse me, guys. He's got to get back for a vote. Hey guys, let me get to my phone. Oh, let me get to my car. Hey. Can phone off on what it says about how we treat the poor and vulnerable. Have a good day, all right? Take care. So I, Bob, Bob right now is joining us. He's the author of a, a phenomenal book, uh, Evolution of God, senior editor at The Atlantic. Welcome, Bob. Thank you. Um, how long did it take you to write Evolution of God? Several minutes, I guess. <laughs> you heard this guy say, I asked Stephen how long. And yet it's longer and more profound than Stephen. <laughs> Isn't that ironic? They are both very long and very profound, I will say. Um, uh, I, I, we were all sort of chuckling a little bit at that ad, uh, the, the, the Values Network ad. And I, th and I think the reason we were chuckling is because it seems a Sisyphean task to, to try to drive the wedge that that ad is trying to drive, right? It's trying to say to you religious folks who are religious conservatives, actually Paul Ryan and Rush Limbaugh and all these sort of totemic figures in your movement, they're actually secretly aligned with this, this godless atheist um, and you should listen to us. And I, I think we all get the sense that that's, that is not the way the political coalition works right now. It doesn't matter how many of those ads you run, right? And I'm, I'm curious, Stephen, what your thoughts are on this as someone who's, I think, politics are lean libertarian um, and who uh, is an atheist, how you sort of uh, see the sort of modern conservative coalition and where your place in it might be or if there is a place in it for you. Oh, there's no place in it whatsoever. <laughs> uh, uh, political psychologists usually say that, that um, political ideologies tend to be organized in, along two dimensions. There's the left-right dimension, then there's an authoritarian libertarian dimension. But in practice, uh, political parties and political movements tend to be coalitions of convenience. There's not necessarily an intellectual common denominator. It used to be that the Democratic Party had both Southern segregationists right. and Northeast Jewish liberals right. just because they found themselves in the same tent. And nowadays, the American Conservative Party has the free market libertarians and the evangelical Christians. It's not easy to find a common denominator, but uh, that's just the way that the, the coalition has, uh, has drifted. And do you think it's drifted that way more? Or is there something, I guess there are two questions. One, is that contingent? Is it accidental? Or is there something essential, right, that unites those, those, those two groups? And do you think it's moved in that way? Has that, in, in, has that um, coalition gotten stronger or weaker as, as time has gone on? Oh, far stronger. Uh, even though the, uh, the Tea Party identifies itself as libertarian, it's really just uh, the, become the extreme right in the American political movement, including and the religious right. Including the religious right, that's right. And Robert Putnam uh, has, uh, who, who 
who's a, a political scientist who, who studies this, um, uh, had, had a long longitudinal study of the Tea Party and basically found one of the ways, if you go back, he'd been interviewing these people for a long time and then saw who ended up as members of the Tea Party, that if you go back and how often people go to church, how religiously they identify, how they feel about issues like gay marriage was one of the best predictors of whether they ended up in the Tea Party. So the Tea Party ended up being this new name that we gave to a group of people that had some set of a beliefs already. That, that's, that's so true. Go ahead. Yeah. In fact, there is a breakaway movement among, in, among libertarians to try to divorce themselves from the, uh, the, the right, right wing evangelical Christians who they found in, their, in the same bed. But they're not calling the shots in that coalition, we should be very clear. I mean, in terms of the weight of where the, the, where the kind of numerical weight is, right, in the voting block, I mean, that, the, the, the numbers and the votes are in, as we saw in Rick Santorum's primary victory last night in Louisiana, are, 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 among, are among the religious folks, right, Bob? Um, yeah, I think that's true. Um, and I, I think there's no inherent correlation between religious belief and really much of anything, and that's one reason these coalitions are so um, fluid. I wanted to say, I but mean, they're not fluid. They're not fluid. I mean, that's the point, right? The point is that, like, actually, our our our, our politics in terms of how often you can predict the likelihood of someone voting Republican by how often yeah. they they go to how how uh, they, how often they go to church. That's particularly true for white people, I should say. That uh, thank that, you. exactly, yeah. yeah. Thank that, you. Yes, that right. I, no, no, and very that, important. That's what I mean. important. Yeah. That, that's yeah. what I mean. Right. right. There's right. no there's no inherent kind of cross ethnic, cross temporal, across time oh, correlation. I, I think. Um, you know, religious people were in the forefront of you know freeing the slaves and so on. Um, but so, they were also no, no, that, I, I understand exactly. that. That's my point. Right. That there, there, there is, uh, you know, I just think there's very little inherent logical correlation between, between pe people's level of religious belief and their and their political affiliation. Yeah. I mean, and yet, what we have in you, practice is the opposite of that. We have a very extremely strong degree of. I, of, of correlation between people's political behavior, their political self-identification, no. and their behavior as practicers of a faith or non-practicers, right? I, I'm not sure that's completely true, because if you look across countries, the countries that have the highest degree of uh, secularism are also the ones that have the most uh, elaborate social safe safety network, namely the countries mm -hmm. of Northern and Western Europe. And over time, as uh, issues have become more more liberal. It used to be that segregation was a, a live political debate. Now it's pretty much dead. It's shifted to should there be similar pe penalties for different kinds of cocaine. But it just shows how far the racial debate has changed. Sure. At the same Likewise, time, it's, it's the more secular countries um, that, first of all, often have more extreme income inequality to deal with with a safety net. And secondly, it's naturally going to be the role of government in a more secular society. In other words, there are religious societies where, where those services tend to get taken care of within the religion, social services and safety nets and things like that. Oh, well, for, that's, not, that's not true. First of all, if you look at the most religious community in America, African Americans, yes, churches do a lot, but they do not have in any way the resources to do what a public safety net goes. And also, you mentioned this at the top of the segment, that religious liberals are making religious arguments against the Ryan budget, and certainly Certainly, if you read the story of Jesus, you can make one. But the problem with all religious, not moral, but religious arguments about public issues like this, like do we cut, uh, does the Bible say we cut taxes at the top or the bottom, right, right. is the Bible is exactly like the writings of the founders. Any religion can, can find read anything, anything into it, right. can read anything into it, and to have a religious argument about for example, do we raise taxes right. uh, and who do we raise them on is utterly ridiculous because you can find that anywhere. Oh, Christ drove the money changers out of the temples. Right. And he must mean he wouldn't like well, Wall Street. And that was one of the things, I think the strange things about the moment we found ourselves in with the debate over the, the uh, birth control copay and the Affordable Care Act was all of a sudden it seemed like we were in this very this strange theological dispute in which the bishops <laughs> were saying, well, that actually, if you put the money through this channel and that channel, that does or does not work, and that's fundamentally not a decision we're making as a secular society. New legislation in Tennessee would require public schools to, quote, teach the controversy on evolution and global warming. Richard Dawkins, author of The God Delusion, joins us when we return. 
This week in Tennessee, the state Senate passed SB 893 that requires public schools to teach what they're calling the, quote, controversy over evolution, global warming, and human cloning. The bill is pejoratively being referred to as the monkey bill, which is, of course, a callback to Tennessee's famous Scopes monkey trial in 1925, when a teacher was convicted for teaching evolution in the classroom. This bill says that teachers must find effective ways to present science curriculum as it addresses scientific controversies. As you can imagine, the Tennessee members of the National Academy of Sciences expressed their opposition to the bill and its companion bill in the House, HB 368, with a letter to the Tennessee House Education Committee. It reads, these bills encourage teachers to emphasize what are misdescribed as the scientific weaknesses of evolution, which in practice are likely to include scientifically unwarranted criticisms of evolution. As educators whose teaching involves and is based on evolution, we affirm that evolution is a central and crucial part of science education. Neglecting evolution is pedagogically irresponsible. Right now, I want to bring in Richard Dawkins, evolutionary biologist, professor at the University of Oxford. His latest book is called The Magic of Reality, How We Know What's Really True. And he was one of the speakers also at yesterday's Reason Rally in Washington. Mr. Dawkins, welcome. Thank you. Um, this seems uh, uh, like a, you know, a kind of eternal recurrence problem, right? I mean, this, this battle it, it doesn't seem to really necessarily uh, move in one direction, or am I wrong? When I see Tennessee passing this law, I think there's an instinct to say, we're just still refighting this. And actually, if you go back and look at Darwin, he was fighting it when, when, when Darwin first published, and we've been fighting it ever since. Has there been progress in the sort of social acceptance? I don't know about social acceptance. I mean, the, the, the fact is that there is no controversy about evolution. It's a fact. Uh, and all the reputable scientists in the world accept that. There is, of course, interesting controversy in science. And it's important that children should uh, be exposed to the fact that scientists don't always agree. Sometimes the evidence is not all in. So that's fair enough. But as for teaching the controversy over <laughs> evolution, what controversy? You might as well teach, in addition to the sex theory of where babies come from, the stork theory of where babies come from. You could, if you like, you could teach uh, the creationist or so-called intelligent design theory. It would take all of about five minutes to give the evidence for it. There isn't any. And then you can get down to the true science. Right. But, but, but my, my, my question more has to do with the fact that, that, that we don't that, that these bills are uh, th these bills keep surfacing, right? That, that we go through these kind of bouts in which there was obviously Scopes trial in 1925. I remember about what is five or six years ago there was a big Pennsylvania trial um, that was more or less along these lines. And so, uh, is, I guess my question is: Is there some percentage of the population that simply because of their faith tradition or the figures in authority that they trust, as opposed to the figures in authority that you or I or some of the viewers may trust, are just not going to? accept this? Is this sort of a battle that will never be won in your mind? Ever since the 1980s, uh, Gallup polls have shown that more than 40% of the American people believe that the world is less than 10,000 years old. Now that's an astonishing error. These people have the vote. These people are ignorant of science and they are voting in politicians who are also ignorant of well, science. But lots of people but who yield power. Yeah, but lots of people who are ignorant about a lot of things have the vote. I mean, that is sort of the crucial well, principle quite. of democracy, but, right? <laughs> that's exactly right. <laughs> Right, and that's why we have representative democracy rather than having plebiscites like they do in some cantons See, of Switzerland. But when you have politicians who are apparently swaying to the wind of public opinion and who are legislating for truly ludicrous anti-scientific laws like this, then I think democracy is in trouble and we need to, to, to look at how to remedy this problem. I was very interested in hearing the earlier discussion and the, the suggestion that um, there might be too much religion in politics. In a funny kind of way, I wonder whether there's too little and whether there's a sort of taboo against challenging politicians with their religious beliefs. So, for example, if you have a presidential candidate, say, who says he's a Roman Catholic, challenge him publicly. Do you seriously believe that the wafer turns into the body of Christ? Do you really believe that the, the wine turns into the blood? Don't let him get away with that truly ridiculous I, beliefs uh, without challenging well, them. Uh, uh, I, I, there's a lot of feelings about <laughs> That, that approach, um, I think that way lies ruin in, in civil war, basically. But, but Bob, um, I, I well, want you to respond to that right after we take this break. If your beliefs are as strong scientifically as you seem to believe they are, what's the problem with them being tested? You're going to decide on the mindset, 
the the training, the intelligence, and the future of this nation from your classroom, from what you and your colleagues deem necessary. And I find that totally anti-American. <sighs> As the uh, state rep, John DeBerry, defending this Tennessee law, which we were just referencing, which is sort of a teach the controversy law, we have Richard Dawkins of Via Satellite, who just, who just made, a, I think, an extremely provocative point that a lot of people on the panel had strong feelings about, which is basically that, that in, in the public realm, if religion is invoked in the public realm, um, then we should uh, subject public figures who invoke it to s skepticism and debate on the articles of doctrinal faith, for instance, the miracle of transubstantiation that constitutes uh, the communion ritual in the Catholic Church the church in which I was raised, the church in which my father was a Jesuit seminarian for seven years. Uh, 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 but that to me, I'll just say from my own part of it, that seems like a recipe for the worst kind of debate because everybody's private beliefs in this sphere are completely preposterous to outsiders. And what you end up with is a whole variety of cross-channel uh, antagonism and hostility. Bob, you seem like you wanted to respond as well. Yeah, well, I think on the one hand, it's fine uh, when people invoke religious belief to defend their views on public policy to point out to them that they can't expect that argument to have traction with a larger world beyond their faith. That's fine. If you mean confronting them in that sense, fine. But when you go around, you know, challenging their theological beliefs, and actually I know Richard goes further. I mean, USA Today quoted him as saying, I think at this rally, maybe that people should show, quote, ridicule and contempt for religion. And I just think that undermines the goals that Richard and I share. I think we both w would like for fundamentalists in Tennessee not to inflict religion on the science curriculum and the question is how to keep them uh, from doing it and I think there's a lot of evidence that what what makes fundamentalists more fundamentalists and more inclined to do that is a sense of threat and siege. when you have a sense of siege and when you have arguably the world's leading Darwinian Richard Dawkins uh, saying associating Darwinism with the idea that we should show contempt for religion I just think that's counterproductive. Uh, Richard, would you like to respond as the world's leading Darwinian? <laughs> I'm not the world's leading Darwinian. I'm, I'm not accepting that. Um, I think that um, we're making too much of a deal of private beliefs versus, versus public beliefs. You challenge a, a candidate about his beliefs on taxation, about military policy and so on. Why don't you challenge his beliefs about what he thinks about the universe and the world? If I'm a voter... You don't think those are I, distinct? As, as, you don't think there, there's a distinction between private belief and public beliefs in exactly that sense, what the tax rate should be well, and how... I, I, I know that's the conventional view, right, and I right. fight this battle a lot. Um, but I, I do think that as a as a voter, if I know that the person I'm contemplating voting for, however good his beliefs on taxation and so on may be, if I know that he privately believes that a 19th century man called Joseph Smith dug up some golden tablets, read them with the age of a stone in a top hat, and translated them out of some ancient language into not 19th century English, but 16th century English, that man was a fraud and a charlatan, and any modern politician who nails his colors to the mast of that particular religion is somebody that I'm suspicious of voting for. I know those beliefs are private, but they're crazy beliefs. And why should I vote for a man, however sensible his public beliefs may be, if his private beliefs are ridiculous and mad? Well, I, uh, I, Susan, you've seen your response. Yeah, it's, it, there, I think that there is enough to question people about in terms terms of the relationship between their religious beliefs and public policy rather than getting into transubstantiation. But I do want to make the, the point I, I mentioned earlier, which is people who are, I would say, below the age of 40 don't understand that the kind of religion talk we're having in presidential campaigns is really quite new. Nobody, Dwight Eisenhower, who I don't know what his private religious beliefs were, he was considered to be religious. Dwight Eisenhower and Abraham Lincoln did not go around talking about how their private religious beliefs or non-beliefs applied to the issues of the day. And one of the, it's very important for people to realize that this constant bringing of religion into political campaigns is really a product of the last 30 years. Uh, the first time it was ever raised, and properly so, was when Kennedy ran in 1960. But all he said then was, uh, Church and state right. separate. The, the Rick speech, the speech that famously up. made uh, Rick Santorum throw up. Jamila and, and Stephen, I want to get your take on this right after we take one, a quick break. 
All right. Uh, uh, the, how we talk about people's beliefs, I think, is sort of where we've been right now, particularly how we talk about people's religious beliefs in the public sphere and the degree of scrutiny we should um, subject them to, and specifically whether we should respect a distinction between sort of beliefs on public matters and public policy and private beliefs, whether those are, you know, doctrinal in nature. I am, just so I'm clear, I'm strongly in the camp of just not talking about people's private beliefs, no matter how preposterous uh, they seem to us from the outside. Jim, uh, Richard Dawkins is arguing the opposite, and Jamila, you seem like you, you are on uh, Dr. Dawkins' side here. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dawkins, and I, I, I just want to say that first and foremost. Here's the thing. If, if a candidate for president believes that I am cursed with blackness because I was on the wrong side of a war with his God, right. if a candidate believes that women should be subject to their husband's will or their father's will and women should be submissive, I need to know that before I go to cast my ballot. Now, we those are public issues, but those, the, those lie on the public side those, of the public-private divide, much more no, than transubstantiation. No, no, yeah, those sure are, they, do. They, they do, but they are just as they are just as strong to be deeply held private beliefs. I need to know what my candidates think, and to give them a pass because you go, oh, that's a private thing. Whether you believe you're actually eating the literal body and drinking the literal blood of your Christ, well, here's the problem with giving them a pass. They legislate that way. There's no inclination to fix problems if you believe that your that your God is going to come back in your lifetime and rapture all you good people up and leave us sinners behind to deal with the fallout from whatever but, issue. For, well, but okay, let me. Uh, first of all, no one's legislating on transubstantiation. Just as, just to take no, okay, that particular okay. matter. I mean, it just on, is not the case that, there, that anyone's way. legislating on transubstantiation. But they're and there are a million. But they're legislating on on you know women. They're they're turning my health into an issue. Yes, absolutely. And I think health into an issue of I agree. Uh, and I think you know life begins at conception because the Pope says it does. I, I, and and that if I if if I present myself to in, right t today in a hospital in Arizona and I am pregnant and the pregnancy will kill me if it continues and I go to a Catholic hospital they have legislated that right. it's fine to let me die. That's a problem and that's a privately held belief that legislators we have, publicly address. And I and I think it's valid to point out to people who favor that policy that if they favor it on religious grounds, they can't expect the rest of us to buy into that because right. we don't share their religion. And I think that degree of argument is fine. I but think, we need to bring it up. We need to know about it. In that it. case, sure. I, and I think we are. I don't think that's, I don't think there's no, there's been a pass granted to anyone, particularly around the birth control debate. I mean, I think that's, that's the area in which, like, clearly we're having a public debate about precisely this, and it's precisely intersectional religion. The question of the, the, the degree of, of uh, you know, how much validity we want to ascribe to some specific doctrinal thing, I think is distinct. Are humans making moral progress? And if so, is it because they're losing their faith? That's up with now. Hello from New York, I'm Chris Hayes. With me this morning, I have Harvard University professor Steven Pinker, who wrote The Better, Better Angels of Our Nature, Washington Post blogger Jamila Bay, Susan Jacoby, the author of Free Thinkers, Robert Wright from The Atlantic, an author of The Evolution of God, and joining us from Washington, Richard Dawkins, author of The God Delusion. Um, we, were, we were just engaged in, I think, a really interesting debate about the degree, where we sort of draw, draw lines between public and private belief, what we subject to scrutiny, how we go after other people's, whether they be public beliefs, or private beliefs, specifically in the case of people's religious beliefs, and whether the privately held doctrinal beliefs that one might have should be subject to public uh, scrutiny or even ridicule, I think, as, as, as uh, Richard Dawkins suggested. And Stephen, uh, I was telling you during the break that you're very polite, and you said you're Canadian, so that explains <laughs> it. Um, but but uh, you didn't get a chance to, to weigh in there, and I want to give you one. Well, it's interesting how the debate has changed. Uh, and it used to be that people debated whether evolution was uh, should be allowed to be taught. Now it's whether the case for so-called so scientific creationism should be added to the mix. Even there, the what is supposed to be taught is not uh, biblical doctrine, but the ginned up so-called scientific evidence for, uh, right. for, for uh, creation. Likewise, the debate used to be on whether homosexuality should be criminalized. That debate isn't held anymore. Now it's about gay marriage. Whether contraception should be legal. That debate is over. It's been won. Now it's just on whether uh, Catholic organizations have to include in their health insurance. For no copay. 
Yeah, right. For issue after issue, the entire debate has shifted in a more uh, progressive, humanistic direction. We tend to lose sight of that because at any given moment, we're talking about the issue of the day, of the morning, of the minute. But over short and long terms of uh, uh, stretches of history, one can see the, uh, the, the progress that we've been made in an era in which, as you showed at the top of the show, secularism has been increasing, religious fundamentalist beliefs have been decreasing. One, one of the things I think is so interesting about this debate is the ways in which in the context, particularly of global warming, which, I, which is, I think, the, the single most important issue we face and where the stakes of all of this are the highest. Um, the, the very slippery way in which the liberal spirit of tolerance and open-mindedness is used to defend skepticism on the scientific consensus on global warming, right? So when you when you when you listen to people talk about when you listen to people who are attacking the, the very robust scientific consensus on the warming planet, um, they will uh, they, they will say basically, well, we're just asking questions, right? We're 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 engaging in the good skepticism um, that 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 you say that you that you hold to, um, and then of course there's there's a religious component to a lot of that this disbelief as well. Here, Rick Santorum um, is talking about about climate scientists in the Philadelphia Inquirer op-ed in February, and he says, climate change's Pharisees reassure us that global warming science is still settled. There's nothing to see here. Move along. Um, Bob, how do you deal with that argument about skepticism, which kind of uses a sort of open-mindedness of the liberal tradition in a sort of jujitsu move against itself? Well, it's actually a challenge because skepticism yeah. is a good thing, and you yeah. sh and you should always, up to a point, you know, question even what seems to be scientific consensus. In the case of evolution, I think we've gone well past the the point where you can reasonably question right. um, the fundamental premise. You know, climate science is tricky because the truth is most of us haven't had time to really delve in the details. I don't feel I but can launch. But that's true about everything. Well, no, evolution. <laughs> I really feel I know enough. I can I can right, argue right, because right. I've I, I've invested the time. Right. Um, I don't think I, I don't think those issues are comparable in the sense of being fundamentally uh, religious. I mean, first of all, I know a number of atheists who are actually climate science skeptics. Sure, a sure. and B. There's no inherent uh, contradiction between scripture and and and, and, and <coughs> the, the, the way there is between a literal reading of Genesis and evolution. As, as it is unfolding in America, though, and I think here is, is where I, I'm, I'm shape-shifting to Jamila's etch-a-sketching and, 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 and Richard Dawkins. Shook up during the break. There is, there is, it, climate change is being used as a religious issue because the, the paragraph they're all using is the, the verse from Genesis that gives man dominion over the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Now, liberal religious people use that to say yes, and we have to do it wisely. We have a custodial Conser responsibility. Conservative religious people say we can do whatever we want with the earth, as Santorum himself has said, not for the sake of earth, but for the sake of us. So if what we want we think is good for us is to strip the earth of all of its natural resources, well, that's our right, because we're such big, good, smart human beings. Stephen. Yeah, I think we always have face the uh, agonizing dilemma of what range of opinion exactly uh, can be yes thank you don't want to have a show where you say well on the one side denying the Holocaust we have yes. so and so yes. here. on the other hand you do want want to be able to marshal quickly and clearly what the evidence is if there is a Holocaust denier you really should be able to come up with six indisputable right. facts that show the Holocaust really did take place right. and likewise climate scientists do have the uh, the onus of having a comprehensible uh, set of arguments why they believe that climate is changing. Likewise for evolution, a defender of evolution should have the evidence at his or her fingertips to persuade people to the extent that they can be persuaded. You have put your finger on literally the driving thing that we think about every week when we put together the show, right? Which is what is the range of opinion, right? Where where do you put where do you put the stake in the spectrum? And that's this and, and when you where you put the stake in the middle or where you put it determines a lot of what kind of conversation you have and how the conversation moves forward. Because, because ultimately you don't want it to just boil down to trust that they're the priests on one side, they're the scientific priests on the other side. The difference is that the reason that I do trust in scientists, right. even when I don't know every detail, is that every time I've had to check, they have had facts and arguments. Right. They've earned that trust. They have to keep re-earning it by being able to put the arguments on the table. I'm a little bit of a defeatist about this because I really do think in the day-to-day -day world of lived experience of people as citizens, as voters, so much does come down to trust. It is about whose sources. When you say, when you say, I haven't, you know, I, I haven't 
haven't really dug into the climate science or and when you say I can defend evolution it's like well yeah I can defend evolution in the way that someone who's like read the Richard Dawkins book <laughs> can defend revolution but like how can I defend evolution but I more or less paraphrase from the selfish gene which Mr. Dawkins wrote like that's and and I more or less trust it because other people seem to trust it and Richard Dawkins has all these credentials and so so no but it has to go beyond that that if you were to challenge Richard on any of any of the facts if you were to follow up on the footnotes of the selfish gene right. you would find there really are peer-reviewed scientific right. papers with evidence that yeah. you can't deny. Rich, Richard, you, you face this, I think you face this all the time, right? I mean, these arguments about skepticism and the way that, 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 that attempts to undermine evolution as a sort of bedrock foundational um, uh, fact about the way the world developed are, are often couched in this kind of um, liberal language of tolerance. What's your sort of response to that? Yes, I, I agree with what all the panel have said about that. Um, in, in, uh, I, for, for me, there is a distinction between uh, climate change, which I don't really feel qualified to, to speak about, and uh, evolution, where I where I really do, and and I agree with Robert Wright about that. I agree with what Susan said. I agree with what uh, with what Stephen <laughs> said. Um, and but I, I I also strongly agree with what Stephen said that even those bits of science that we 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 actually haven't read up ourselves, we trust because science has earned the trust. Uh, we know about peer review. Uh, we know that um, that if a position has been argued in the scientific literature, it will be challenged. It will be tested, and so there is a sort of robustness about uh, scientific conclusions which science has earned and 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 theology which is a total non-subject hasn't I mean, in, in the case of climate change by the way it's not just Genesis it's also revelation uh -huh. um, we don't need to bother to have right. good stewardship of the world because Jesus is coming back right. and soon. I mean, that's one of the dominant arguments that you'll hear from these nutcases. Mm -hmm. But just to underscore the challenge, I think Stephen and I both remember a time, we've written about evolutionary psychology, when there was what seemed to be a consensus, at least within psychology, that bringing in considerations of natural selection into the study of human nature was almost illegitimate. And I think we both agree. There was something like a consensus that we agree was basically um, wrong. So you do have to be skeptical even of consensus. Yeah. And in climate science, the reason I feel confident is because of opportunities I've had to interrogate yes, exactly. people in the, the field. Same with not me. always even scientists, but right. people who just just know this stuff. And the public at large, I don't doesn't think have that, that opportunity. opportunity right? I mean, they but see two conflict. They don't know. You but know, that's, you but can always trot out one scientist from some sure, college. Right. But this is the problem. This is the bedrock problem of, 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 of not just this issue. I mean, it's the bedrock problem that we face in sort of the project of self-governance and like keeping the civilizational project going which is that yeah like, you know someone works 12 hours a day they get home they have to deal with child care they have to you know they don't they, they don't I you know I live this life where I go talk to a climate scientist and then I can interrogate them right w the way that it cascades down is it cascades down through these trust relationships right and so those trust relationships are forged they're not forged on the basis of going back and forth to someone they're forged on the basic of of affiliation of identity relationships Relationship, of kinship, of, of consonance of worldview, of, of the degree to which you feel this person is trustworthy. So when you, someone who fits all those things says, do not listen to the climate scientists, they are trying to pull the wool over your eyes, the question of how you attack that authority from outside the sphere of it is, is the most important one. And I want you to answer that, Susan Jacoby, after this break. Something. We have spiraled up, upwards, as we always do on the show, into abstraction. But I want to ground it because, it, <laughs> no, because I, I really do, this is, this is something that I've, I've, I have a whole chapter in my book about and something I, I think about a lot. It's like the process of public belief formation because ultimately that's how we get our policies, right? I mean, and that process is a complicated one and, and how we move pu public opinion in a certain direction, social consensus, when it's not even just moral precepts, right? It's not normative questions, but it's just actually empirical questions that describe what is happening to the world. Is it getting warmer? Is it getting warmer because of the carbon that humans are releasing into the world? I want to show this graph. Um, it shows correlation between religious affiliation and the percentage of people believing in man-made global warming. I should say human-made global warming. Um, so total U.S. population, about 45% believe that the, uh, trust the scientific consensus or believe in the scientific consensus on global warming. People who are unaffiliated religiously are much more likely to believe in that, the scientific consensus, up near 60%. And white evangelicals are far less likely to believe in it. And I think we've seen the way in which um, the uh, the issue has been sort of 
transmuted into a culture war issue, fundamentally, where we're now in the place of, of trust and authority and tribal signaling as opposed to a discussion of, of, of evidence. Right? Let's say yeah. also this is an educational <clears throat> issue, and nobody wants to say this because you get accused of saying that religious fundamentalists are stupid. And by the way, I want to point out that not all evangelicals are fundamentalists. There right. are educated yes. liberal evangelicals as well. But there is a direct correlation between... There are educated fundamentalists, funda I should say, yeah, actually. But there is a direct correlation between the prevalence of religious fundamentalists and lack of education. The, and this is probably what Santorum was talking about, too. You go to college, you get to be liberal. No. But you go to college, you presumably learn something about real science, real history. But, but, and know, so there is the fact to, is, to, is to, people to, with eighth grade and partial co college education, about 80% of them describe themselves as conservative religious. But I'll bet the graph we just saw is not entirely a, a product of, of an, uh, an education gap, per se. My guess is that the evangelicals, I'll bet because of large. social issues and so on, came to trust certain validators, the conservative That's right. validators. That's right. And now this issue arises, uh, and those validators are, are saying, no, glo global warming isn't happening. And, and I've got to think that's a big part of it. But the validators, you trust I, you a question of education, too. I, I think there's a, <clears throat> excuse me, a perfect marriage between what the two of you are saying. It is absolutely an issue of education. Americans at large don't understand how to question appropriate. They, they hear something, they go, well, I trust the source that I'm, I'm listening to. And they don't, know, they don't know how to say, well, who funded that study? Right. Where did the money come? from which you did, did were there any universities what exactly does it mean to have a study that's peer-reviewed and what does it mean that this is someone who I've heard on a show with a host whose name I right. might or might not like the fact that John Huntsman when he was in the race said call me crazy but I believe right. in evolution I believe the scientists on global warming and people did we featured we featured crazy. that tweet a lot but um, I, I, I want to push back on that just for one second because again this I disagree with what you're saying there I don't mm -hmm. think I'm I consider myself a pretty educated person. In fact, mm -hmm. this is my professional full-time job is doing this. I'm very lucky that this is all I do is think about this stuff and I read peer-reviewed studies and things like that. And I, if I am honest with myself, I am still at a fundamental level relying on trust to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. And there's no way of getting around that and to pretend that, oh, what we, the enlightened cognoscenti do, is so different from what they are doing who just trust authority, I think is really self-delusional. I think it, I, I really do. Stephen. Yes, but, but you do, you are skeptical about your trust in that right. you ask the question, who should I trust and why. And you have a reason for trusting some people rather than others. That You know that every time they are challenged, they can come up with the evidence and the arguments. And by the way, I think the politicization of these issues works both ways. I know a number of climate scientists who say the worst thing that has ever happened in raising awareness of climate change is Al, Al Gore's Gore, movie. Yes. Right. Because he, in effect, politicized it. Right. Not that anything, anything that he said in the documentary right. they had a problem with. Just because he is a figure that is associated, obviously, with a certain political party and ideology, and so now it's, it's actually a reverse effect, right? Rather than yeah. saying who you trust, it's who you don't trust, right? Exactly. And I feel that way on issues all the time. I mean, I remember seeing Alan Greenspan testify on behalf, uh, in front of a Senate committee, and testify on behalf of immigration reform, liberalization of immigration reform, and being like, oh, maybe I'm wrong about immigration reform. <laughs> Alan Greenspan is saying so, it. So Al Gore can rev up the base, but at the same time, he is probably alienating the, the skeptics. R R Richard Dawkins, how do you how do you cross the sort of gulf of this this sort of trust gap? I mean, that that is the fundamental question, right? I mean, I think that's something that you're engaged in trying to do, uh, how do you do it? Well, I do agree it is a very, very difficult problem because nobody can read up all the scientific right. literature. Nobody, the, the <laughs> best scientist in the world, can't keep up with science outside his or her own field. And so there really is a matter of trust. I keep agreeing with Steve when he says that, that, that science has earned the right to trust because you know that when people are challenged in, in science, they can produce the evidence. They can say, look, here's Brown and McAllister, 2008, showing so-and-so. You can actually cite chapter and verse. That's what I worry about in the earlier question about teach the controversy. If you say teach the controversy in science classes, it implies that there really is a controversy, right. that there really is a kind of balance of scientific weight on both sides. And there aren't two sides in that particular case of evolution. Maybe in climate change there are, and I don't feel knowledgeable enough to be to be sure about that. But in evolution, well, I there do, and I don't think there are. <laughs> okay. I mean, I'm, but again, like I, I think that because of all the times that I've spent talking to climate scientists, you know, who, who uh, Bob. 
Yeah. Um, j- well, just that, to, that sounds good to me. I mean, I, I, you right. know, I, I, I get that. Right. Um, just to get back to an earlier uh, hobby horse of mine, and, and whether atheists should be confrontational, I do think if you want to inspire trust among evangelicals, and you're a climate scientist, right? I would avoid making fun of their religion. It's just elementary human psychology. <laughs> that, that seems like a pretty <laughs> strong piece well, of that, advice. This is my Mr. point, Wright. and I think it translates into the field I was talking about earlier, which is, you know, education policy. Right. Or anything, really. Um, Richard Dawkins is the executive director of the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science and author of the book, The God Delusion, among others. Mr. Dawkins, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much indeed. All right, from the uh, ethereal to the human, a pastor's confession about his own religious beliefs. We'll be right back. Years ago, an academic study located and interviewed five pastors, all working within their parishes, who had, without their congregations knowing it, stopped believing in God. They were secretly atheists. A website started not long, not long after, clergyproject.com, to give current and former members of the clergy a confidential forum to discuss their secret lack of belief. The website currently claims more than 185 members. We contacted the site's administrators to express our interest in speaking to one of those members. Speaking to one of our producers, one pastor said he no longer wanted to be secret about his skepticism. He wanted to come out. His name is Mike Aus. He is a working pastor at a non-denominational church in Houston, and he joins us now from Washington, where yesterday he attended the Reason Rally. Um, Mr. Aus, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Chris. Good to be here. Um, tell me a little bit about your just personal journey. How did you uh, enter, the, en- enter the clergy? Why did you enter the clergy? What was your religious faith upbringing? Um, I grew up as a Lutheran, uh, mainline Protestant. Uh, had always gone to church my entire life, and um, just was a person of faith. And and when I went to seminary, I got into it with the, um, like I said, the best of intentions, believing pretty much at the time I felt uh, the whole doctrinal, um, you know, all, you know, all the doctrines and teachings of the church. And I just wanted to help people and, and enjoyed uh, enjoyed church life. And so that's how I got into it. And um, when did you start to question uh, that faith? What what sort of precipitated the beginning of that journey? Well. Um, for me, it's been um, kind of a slowly jettisoning the um, uh, some of the doctrines I found difficult to believe, and I would just tell myself, well, maybe you don't have to believe in the virgin birth, but you could still be a Christian, or maybe you don't have to believe that uh, Jesus fed the 5,000, but you could still be a Christian. And I, as I started to jettison the beliefs, I came to uh, realize uh, fairly recently that there wasn't a whole lot left. What do you mean by that? What was that realization like? Um, well, actually, it was brought on by reading some books from some of your other guests today, like Stephen <laughs> Pinker and Richard Hawkins. Uh, so <laughs> they're part of the reason I'm here. Um, uh, and uh, it's it's been difficult uh, to say... Um, you know, the farewell to parts of my life that have meant something to me, but um, it's also thrilling to see the world in a new way through Darwinian lenses, for example, through the lens of uh, behavioral genetics and uh, cognitive science that are explaining so much about human nature, things that uh, religion could never explain. At what point was there a gap? Was there a gap between what you were doing? I think we have some some sound of you uh, uh, preaching here, um, and maybe we can play this, and you, you can sort of comment on it. Um, in 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 having to go to work every day and preach and talk about God and talk about faith when you uh, internally were having some very very serious and severe doubts. Here here's a little bit of your preaching. For some reason, God just time and time again that apparently does not seem to step in and magically fix the adversity, does he, in our life. He just doesn't magically wave his magic wand and fix everything in our life because I think he's allowing us to grow through adversity. And that sounds like tough love, but I think it's true. Do you think that's true? Did you think that's true when you were saying that? Um, I don't recall exactly you know, when I gave that message. I've, I've tried always to preach with as much integrity as possible, uh, never to be disingenuous from the pulpit, but try to insert uh, uh, some of, and of course there I think I was wrestling with the ultimate theological question, the question of theodicy, for which there is no good answer. Theodicy being, uh, if there is a good and loving God, why does he permit so much evil and suffering in the world? And, and frankly, for me, that's been uh, really the big unresolvable question. Uh, we have, you know, we Christians tend to proclaim a God of love and uh, grace and uh, um, who cares about every human being deeply, but then 
he has a hard time getting around to feeding hundreds of millions of people on the brink of starvation every day. And that's the that issue of theodicy is still a very big one for me. Bob? Yeah, can I ask Mike a question? I'm Please. curious if he feels any urgency about persuading believers, including maybe ones who are in his congregation, uh, of, of the truth of atheism, or whether he feels that, look, perfectly good work can get done in a church, was getting done in a church, and, and you know, let the, you know, lead people to their own devices. You know, I guess I'm still thinking about that. Um, there's part of me that does want to share um, uh, what I've been learning, what I've been thinking about. Um, uh, I, I believe um, in church there are many people, uh, both lay people and clergy, who are on a spectrum. I think all of us in church, at mm -hmm. some extent, struggle in our faith. We're on a continuum. I don't think the line is, is necessarily that sharp between believer, non-believer, agnostic, atheist. I think all of us struggle. We're on a continuum. Um, if you have um, the Pope on one end of the spectrum and Richard Dawkins on the other end of the spectrum, once upon a time I was closer to the Pope, now I'm much closer to Richard Dawkins. Um, and uh, I, I would like to talk about that. Uh, yes, churches do some great work, um, but I'm not sure that church life functions all that well. If church life functioned um, very well, then one would expect that the metrics of social well-being in this country would be much better in religious areas of this country versus less religious areas, and that's not the case. Um, are you are you currently still uh, at, at your church, or, or, or I mean, are you going to go preach next Sunday? With um, I'm I'm going to go back next week and uh, meet with my leadership and talk about where we're going to go from here, and um, we'll see. <laughs> I think I have a sense of what they're going to say. I mean, yeah. uh, and I guess this brings the question that I think is a really important one that I think um, for people that are not not believers and are, are not embedded in the social fabric that goes along with uh, reli religious faith uh, and, and religious practice, the degree to which the social life of that is as important, perhaps, as the internal uh, spiritual life of that. I mean, that, uh, that, that, that must be, I, I know in my, just in my own life and in, in the, the, the Catholic world in which I grew up, um, that was as much, I think, of what being Catholic was, was the parish and parish life and, and the community of fellowship that that entailed as whatever I thought about transubstantiation, which I frankly didn't think a lot about. No, I, I think you're absolutely right on Mark, Chris. That's been my experience in nearly 20 years of ministry, is that people gravitate to the community life, the, the, the warmth that they can experience. I mean, Homo sapiens is a tribal creature. We need a tribe. And people ex do experience emotional support and uh, community and caring for each other within churches very often. Um, uh, and the doctrinal issues are often uh, not primary. Um, one of the dirty little secrets of Christianity is hardly anyone ever reads the Bible. And I think if they did, the whole thing would be in big trouble. <laughs> uh, the Catholic Church thought that too at one point, yes. once, <laughs> upon, once yes. upon a time. Uh, Pastor Mike Alsa, stick around. We're going to talk about a little bit more about this when we come back. Okay. It's an uh, ap opposite bump in Jeff Mangum, who uh, has a very complicated relationship to religion in, in his music. Um, we have uh, Pastor Mike Aus, uh, who who is... Um, sort of coming out on our show today, actually, right now, yeah. in national television, that he is uh, no longer believes in the, 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 the Christian faith that he has been preaching for 20 years. And, and Stephen Picker, I wanted to ask you, hearing him talk about reading one of your books in the context of that kind of trajectory, I wonder what you, your reaction is to that. Yeah, I mean, I've never written a book defending atheism as, right. as a... As yeah, a, it's uh, not, yeah. But what I do try to do is explain some of the phenomena that traditionally have been attributed to, uh, to religion, the presence of uh, moral conscience, the ability to be conscious, the, uh, the fact that we're intelligent, that we're reasoning creatures, embedded in an overall naturalistic view of the, the history of life in the universe. And I think when you see that there is a satisfying, indeed a thrilling story of how we got to be uh, who we are, then it makes some of the narratives from the religious tradition just that much less compelling. We do have an answer to the question of where we came from, why we think, why we can make moral choices. You don't need Jesus, you don't need scripture, you don't need uh, religious doctrine to understand our place uh, in the world. And I'm guessing that that's why uh, the writings of a psychologist should be seen as having anything to do with uh, the, the validity of religious belief. Is, is that more, more or less right, Mike? 
Absolutely, that's a great summary. It was uh, reading, uh, especially in um, uh, Stephen Pinker's book, The Blank Slate, uh, where he, he, just as he said, uh, the power of uh, scientific thought to explain, uh, you know, answers that we used to look to religion for. I came to understand that, um, for example, altruism has its roots in our ancestral past, and that religion isn't the source of our altruistic uh, impulses, but rather it became the repository, the place where we expressed these uh, impulses towards uh, goodness and love that uh, developed uh, thousands of years before. Bob? Yeah, can I ask Mike another question? I mean, um, I'm sure he's familiar with the ways in which you can evoke religion and religious impulses to bring out the best in people, to encourage altruism more than they might otherwise exhibit. I'm wondering if he's thought a little about if he wants to keep inspiring people to do yeah. things like that, how he how might you do, do that? it on a naturalistic basis. Yeah. Have, have you given that some thought, or I mean, do, do you talk? Oh, you're asking, I'm sorry, you're asking me. Yeah, 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 please. Yeah, would you invoke yeah, evolutionary yeah, psychology? Thought to or? Pardon? Is this something you think about how you can sort of convert the sort of the work that you've been doing in in sort of moving people to a sort of elevated moral plane in a secular context? Yes, absolutely. I would like to just pursue uh, my readings and um, uh, and uh, you know help people learn more about uh, what I've learned through these uh, you know evolutionary psychology, uh, behavioral genetics, cognitive science, and uh, even finding ways. That I think there are probably ways you can make connections with um, uh, parts of scripture. I mean, it's uh, scripture is not. I'm not saying scripture is devoid of wisdom. You just have to hunt pretty hard to find it sometimes. But I think. <laughs> There are connections, uh, pa 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 Pastor Mike. Let me let me ask you one more question. We had Richard Dawkins on before, and I, I want to address this because he's he's got a very kind of hard-edged approach to speaking about religious people and their beliefs and says words like nuts and crazy and those are words that I really dislike just as generally because I think they kind of tend to um, stand in the way of the sort of empathy yeah. needed to actually have productive conversation and, and public dialogue and, and I wonder w what your sense is of how um, someone like Richard Dawkins, how that language resonates among the people, that the, the, the flock of faithful that you have been um, um, stewarding and being, being among for the last 20 years. Well, uh, I, I think very, very highly of Richard Dawkins. His books have been uh, significant in my journey as well. Um, so I don't want to address necessarily um, you know, his, his choice of rhetoric. That's, uh, he, he can choose to do that. And I think uh, maybe different people, different rhetorical styles for different people, perhaps, is right. not the language that I would choose to use. Um, because I would like to try to build bridges and, and uh, look for more understanding between the non-believing and the believing communities. Susan? I, I think if there is one thing the secular community is missing right now, it's what a great man who's one of the many things lost from our history, Robert Green Ingersoll, who was known as the great agnostic yes. in the 19th century. There has to be a... that he... What he showed people was that passion and reason are not opposed to each other. For instance, one of his favorite lectures, it started with the great soliloquy of Lear on the Heath, poor naked wretches, wheresoever you are, and ending with give the superflux to them and show the heavens more just. This is a kind of secular rhetoric which was common then, which hmm. isn't common now. Absolutely. It is sorely lacking. Just as, just as Darwin put it on the page, there is a grandeur in this view of life. Life. Right. It is not true that you cannot make secular speeches like this, hmm. but nobody today is doing it. We lack that person. That's interesting. We, la we, we, we lack a sort of uh, a vocabulary of secular inspiration. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. uh, Pastor Mike Aus, um, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Uh, I really, really appreciate you being here and being so open and honest. And uh, good, luck, good luck with that meeting next week. <laughs> Thanks for having me, Chris. Good to be here. All right. What you should know for the news week ahead, coming up next. lines we're playing for you. You should really check out their album. Our guests are back to tell us what we should know as the news unfolds this week. Steven Pinker, what should what should folks know? Despite all of the bloodshed that they're going to see this week, and there will be bloodshed, there'll be <laughs> things blowing up, the rate of death in war has been going down since 1946. It hasn't been a smooth decline. It's been bumpy. It hasn't gone down to zero, but it has gone down. Something to keep in mind as you see things blowing up. This, this just happens to coincide with a 600-page book you wrote on precisely this topic. I 
people should also know that. Um, and it's it's really a remarkable book in, in, in that respect because I think um, we tend to get very focused, as you said, on the news of the moment, uh, particularly the sort of 140 character bite size of Twitter. And um, there is a feeling sometimes of, oh, we're moving backwards or, or a feeling of despair or a feeling of hopelessness that we're not sort of on this sort of long trajectory. Um, and the book is very persuasive, very persuasive, I have to say, that things are getting better. The humans are actually getting less violent. It's called The Better Angels of Our Nature, Why Violence Has Declined. What, what got you interested in this topic? Why, how did you come to write that book? Human nature. Uh, are we doomed by uh, our evolved brain to constant warfare and strife? And the answer is no, because there are other parts of the brain, such as a moral sense and a capacity for reason, that can, that can uh, tame our inner demons, the parts of the mind that Abraham Lincoln called the better angels the better of our angel. nature. And there are, are, I think there are certain, one of the points you make in the book, there are certain social situations, certain institutional structures, certain um, pr practices, of uh, social practices that cultivate the better angels and, and diminish the parts of our nature that are the most violent. Absolutely. It's institutions that call forth our better angels that deserve the credit for the progress that we have enjoyed. It's a really fantastic book, um, and, and you should know that it's getting better. Even in really bad weeks, it's getting better. Jamila Bay, uh, what should folks know? Well, this week is still a big week for atheists. Um, the American Atheist Convention with Dr. Dawkins goes on today and tomorrow in Washington, D.C. Uh, the what do we do now? We've, we've come out, now what is the topic? Now, at the end of this week in Fort Bragg, North Carolina, the military atheists and secular humanists who have been banned from meeting as atheists on, on Fort Bragg proper, uh, they're going to have a big old festival and uh, they're going to have a lot of music and a lot of family activities or whatnot uh, at the end of the week on the 31st. So it's, I it's, did not know that. Yeah, it's pushback from the uh, Billy Graham Jr. crusade, uh, forgive me. Uh, it's the, it, they were proselytized too and then they said, well, we'd like to have a secular meeting and, and they were banned, they were stonewalled and not allowed to. So it's been a year and then some in the making to uh, let the secular families who are fighting for all of our rights and defending all of our rights be protected themselves. Uh, Susan Jacoby, what should folks know? That, that was one of my things, and I'll just second that. Sorry. No, that's all right. The, the use of military bases for evangelical proselytizing and the, and the discrimination against secular soldiers is a real scandal. It is completely unconstitutional. This is something people should look out for. Number two, big story last year. Even as we speak, uh, a committee in Egypt to, to select the members of the Constituent Assembly who will be writing the new Constitution for Egypt are supposed to be selecting those people. There is every indication that there are going to be very few women on those yes. on those committees. It's very important. Everybody who was, was burbling over with joy about the Arab Spring should think about what this has meant. And I'm not saying that the overthrow of those sure. dictators was wrong. I'm saying the ascendancy of religious parties who occupy 170% of seats in Parliament is going to have serious consequences for women. And I'll leave you with this significant thought. Uh, they have proposed that the National Council for Women, which is a 30-year-old organization of women in Egypt, be renamed the secular, the, the National Council for the Family hmm. to better represent, hmm. quote, unquote, the complementary roles of men and women. Hmm. Hmm. What that means is women in their place. There are going to be bad things going on for women in Egypt as a result of the growth of Muslim religious parties there. It's a very bad thing. Something to keep an eye on. Uh, uh, Bob Bright, what should folks know? Um, this week, Peter Beinert's book, The Crisis of oh. Zionism, will be published. Um, it is, among other things, an attempt to salvage a two-state solution while there's still time, and I think there's not much. Um, you should know that he will be attacked viciously from the right. He will be called anti-Israel, possibly even anti-Semitic, although, ironically, he attends an Orthodox uh, synagogue. Right. Um, I think it's a, it's a really important book and a courageous one, and it's very much in Israel's and America's interest that people read it and uh, debate it vigorously. We did, uh, I guess it was two weeks ago on Sunday, we did a, a full two hours on, on uh, Israel and Palestine in the Middle East, and in preparation for that, I read the book, and it is really a phenomenal work. I mean, it's, it's just, it's incredibly well written, incredibly well argued, incredibly passionate, soulful, honest, bracing, um, and I really do think uh, folks should read The Crisis of Zionism by Peter Beinhardt, and it, don't worry if you haven't heard about it yet, you're going to, because um, there's going to be a lot of uh, a controversy over it, and you're already sort of starting starting to see it, the, 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 the beginnings of it mm -hmm. um, begin to bubble up. I want to thank my guest today, Stephen Pinker, author of The Best
better, better angels of our nature, Jamila Bay, the host of Sparring with Jamila, the Sex, Politics, and Religion Hour, Susan Jacoby, the author of Freethinkers, and Robert Wright from The Atlantic Magazine. Thank you all. Thank you for joining us.